to welcome each and every one of you for this joint webinar of ACMA and Altum on the building resilient supply chain with technology integration and digital manufacturing. And uh, I'm very, very happy to tell you, it may be the speakers or maybe the um, uh, topic that has in, uh, attracted more people. We have a very good, uh, enormous number of 500 registrations uh, who are wanting to listen to what all you are going to say today. And uh, we have Mr. Daniel Paisat from uh, the show systems uh, as the speaker. We have Mr. Jan Vigal from uh, Stratasys. We have uh, Mr. Abhishek uh, Kalra from Altam Technologies. And we have Mr. Parnagosh from Unominda. He is wearing two hats today. He is also the chairman of NR Digital uh, uh, Forum. And uh, without much delay, I would now request Mr. Parnagosh to have, uh, have a formal welcome address for the session. Thank you. Good afternoon, all of you. Hope you all are keeping safe and healthy uh, for yourself and your family members. Uh, since all our offices are now almost open across the country, so hope all, all of you are taking uh, sufficient care and safety for yourselves. And uh, please uh, maintain <laughs> social distance as well. So today we have a very eminent line of speakers uh, as uh, Binakshi already shared. Mr. Daniel Pizak, who is a mechanical industry process consultant and manage, uh, management senior director for DESO Systems. And Mr. Jan Regel, who is the head of manufacturing business unit sales for EMEA and Asia Stratasys. Uh, the panel discussion will be moderated by Mr. Abhishek Kaldra, who is the associate vice president, Altem Technologies Private Limited. Uh, my dear participants from the industry, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you to this evening session of Definitely. webinar on building resilient supply chain with technology integration and digital manufacturing. The digital committee of ACMA works very closely with the digital technologies service providers in order to create awareness amongst the ACMA community. In the joint study conducted by SIAM and ACMA in 2019, Additive manufacturing has been identified as one of the 11 technologies that would impact the Indian auto industry. With this in mind, and as part of various knowledge sessions being organized by ACMA, the Northern Region and Digital Subpillar is pleased to bring to its members a special webinar session on building resilient supply chain and technology integration and digital manufacturing in association with Altem Technologies. Transportation and mobility industry has been one of the most significant pillars of the emerging Indian economy, contributing substantially to the Indian GDP. Uh, uh, stringent regulatory compliance requirements like BS4 and BS6 in part with global standards coupled with ever increasing competition from overseas markets uh, makes it most challenging for the industries to operate. As you know, the disruption is hitting everyone very hard at this point of time. In addition to this, COVID-19 restrictions have increased the pressure to meet challenging targets on the already burdened industry. Empowerment through industry-focused collaboration and innovation is a key to efficient mobility solutions without increasing costs or reducing quality. Today in this session, the speakers will demonstrate how leading suppliers in automotive ecosystem and their OEMs across the world use collaborative innovative platform to manage their ideation to prototyping through design for additive and manufacturing processes to build resilient fail proof supply chains and not just meet but beat product development timelines with adhering to regulatory compliances. I take this opportunity to invite and introduce the speakers for today's session. The first speaker is Mr. Daniel Pizak, Mechanical Industry Process Consultant, uh, Management Senior Director, Desaw Systems. Daniel Pizak has graduated in Mechanical Engineering. He has over 35 years of huge experience in CAD, CAM, CAE, and PLM. After positions held in, tech, in technical support and product management in various CAD, CAM companies, CC, CC Graph, Matra Data Vision, he joined Desaw Systems Provence in 1999 to manage the competency center. The main activities of DSP competency center are around tooling, machining, reverse engineering, rapid prototyping, additive manufacturing, and data exchanges. 10 years later, he became responsible in different CATIA technical teams inside DESO systems for the EMEA region, design and engineering. 
and since january 2020 he is managing the worldwide catia mechanical industry process success organization with a strong focus on lightweight engineering generative designs composites mold and dye additive manufacturing so without further ado let us uh, invite daniel he is an illustrious uh, having he has having an illustrious career and a profound speaker and uh, welcome daniel please uh, start your presentation thank you Sorry Thank to you. interrupt. I think uh, Mr. Abhishek Kalra, uh, over to you uh, for a quick introduction about Altum Technologies. Yeah, could you enable me to share? Uh, yeah, well, lovely. Yeah, given given the presentation. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I'm not going to keep you uh, all of you waiting too much for Mr. Daniel and followed by Mr. Yan's presentation. I would like to just quickly introduce ourselves. First of all, I thank all of you for joining in today, this afternoon, uh, and I hope sincerely that all of you are safe. Um, uh, Altum Technologies is a company we started in 2011, and we are very proud that for, for the past decade, we have been leading design and manufacturing innovation in India um, uh, through our various products and services. Uh, we are headquartered in Bangalore, but have presence all across uh, the country. In fact, I'm very proud to say that uh, the Minda Group is a very large and very esteemed customer of ours uh, itself with um, additive manufacturing solutions at five plus sites. Apart from that, we have 400 plus customers in various domains, and uh, we have been the largest partner for Dassault Systems and Stratasys in the past uh, 10 years. Um, uh, we believe that we want to be a 3D innovation platform company. We believe that we want to provide end-to-end -end solutions right from the concept stage uh, where a team of designers is thinking what they'd like to build to the final stage where they are manufacturing ready. And we do that by the means of uh, the tools supported by Dassault Systems Stratasys uh, and some other, some other tools. Uh, we've also been facilitated with a lot of awards in our journey. Uh, starting from some government-given awards. We, we are considered as one of the top 100 SMEs of the country. Frost & Sullivan has called us as the most innovative 3D printing company uh, of India uh, in the past many years. And we're very proud to say that we are, we are the best customer support partner for Stratasys across the world. Um, with respect to our, our offerings in the automotive industry, we, we are again very proud that we are able to give rapid fabrication solutions with 3D printing, design innovation solutions with, uh, with the Dassault solutions, and 3D digitization solutions. And if you notice, you see, see a lot of common names uh, across these various, pro various products line, this, thus meeting our objective of being a 3D innovation uh, platform uh, provi provider. Uh, and uh, very proud to say that we have 400 plus customers, some of the top automotive OEMs, Ford, Ashok Leland, Hyundai, General Motors, and suppliers such as the Minda Group, Denso, uh, Veera Vahan, so on and so forth. So without further ado, I'd, I'd like uh, to hand over the mic to Mr. Daniel. Uh, you can keep your question. Uh, the participants are requested to keep typing their questions in the chat. I will be picking up questions from the chat will, and will direct them to the relevant speakers. Thank you so much for listening to me, and over to Mr. Daniel. Can you make me presenter, please? Oops. So hello, um, hello to all of you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, good evening. <laughs> For me, it's still uh, it's still the morning. Um, so the idea of this talk is to talk about um, uh, changes, changes which are occurring, drastic changes which are occurring uh, in the automotive industry, uh, which is uh, moving um, uh, from thermal propulsion engine to electro mobility. And um, but as you know, sometimes challenges are also the the, the good way to. It's also uh, opportunities for you. And uh, it's a good way to, to transform uh, your company and, and be more, more, even more competitive uh, in the market. So, and one way of doing that is maybe to adopt some of the DASO system solution, which is uh, really helping the supply chain to transform and succeed. So let's start. 
jumps. As you know, there are a lot of changes. Uh, we go from um, internal combustion engine to el electrical, el uh, sorry, <laughs> hybrid electrical vehicle. We go to battery electrical vehicle, uh, charging electrical vehicle, and now we are talking about mo mo mobility devices. Okay, so it's the time of changes. And the big change is mainly to go out of diesel, diesel and to move in uh, electric. You can see here the figures of uh, the registration of cars in Europe. Uh, so the diesel has been signific significantly dropped and uh, even passed over um, electrical vehicles. For example, even in India, some uh, OEMs announced a major shift uh, towards electrical vehicles, uh, like, like, like Tata Motors, for example. Um, what is also important is this move, this shift from um, thermal engine or combustion engine to electrical is also a big, big move in terms of um, uh, tool and know-how. Uh, so traditional mechanical engineers are no longer uh, as much uh, used to design a car, but people are now um, moving to a new or changing their, 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 their profile to go to mechatronics, to go to system engineering, and also to software and uh, electrical engineering. And by the way, for example, Jaguar Land Rover, um, which is a Swedish system customer on 3D experience, for example, uh, they are really looking and they make some special partnership with the university to have the right people, the right students, uh, trained uh, with a proper um, with a proper skills on those new uh, technology mechatronics system engineering software and electrical engineering if you now look at all the various segments of the transportation and mobility industry car and light truck racing cars motorcycle blah 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 or even train and truck and buses there is of course some um, big changes um, uh, number of ca the cars the light trucks the suv um, are notably going down uh, where um, formula one NES, nescar others are is a big growth and uh, in continuous progress so because of this change okay but again change equals opportunity so for the supplier it's, it's quite it's tough it might be tough okay if you look at the various uh, main equipment of uh, of a car for example or a truck and if you look their market the market size uh, in, in billions of US dollars uh, in 2018, uh, there are some changes, probably transmission, um, brakes, axles, um, exhaust system, um, which is an, just normal, follow the trend of going from out of diesel and move to electrical, uh, where some other uh, sub, sub segment like electric, electrical drivetrain, battery, uh, sensors, electronics, this is going up, okay? But it's a fact. So, you, and in fact, um, there will be, uh, the, the, the what, um, selected or let's say classified the suppliers in three uh, main categories, the one who are with growth, the one who are stagnant, and the one who are declining. But don't worry, there is, um, there is some solution for all of them. So if you look at the stagnant supplier, the idea is, of, is to expand, defend, and pivot. So shift invest, investment and focus resources on high return product area, acquire peers, and uh, align uh, on a long-term strategy where, um, and, and of course, remove the products which are not uh, best sellers. For the declining supplier, they, they have to invest in developing markets. Um, they have to harvest remaining value and leveraging scale, and they need probably to sell business in difficulty to competitors to revise their strategies. And for the growth guy, uh, develop cutting edge technology to maintain leadership, uh, acquire competitors, and um, spin off growth segment from their larger parents. Okay, and we are helping all those type of suppliers. And of course, everybody want to go from the declining side to the growth side. So if you look at those automotive automotive suppliers, you have different business model and different priorities. Okay, you have local operation, global operation, product innovator, and process specialist. I think that if I look at India, maybe India is more on this quarter, okay? You have to counterbalance the strong uh, pressure on price coming from the OEM. You prob you're mainly uh, producing locally and you are mainly process specialist. Um, the idea is to go more global, we'll check, 
the idea is to, to invest on new winning technology and of course to manage the leadership and manage global complexity because those products are coming more and more complex just because you are combining mechanical and electrical and electronics for example so how do how do you change you have first to optimize and enhance your existing legacy okay so you have to go from home region focus process specialist and move to product in innovators multi-regional uh, global uh, um, player so detect def defect earlier to increase product quality excel in operation operation excellence is key uh, increase the revenue on the existing product and of course optimize um, the quality improve the quality and optimize the production capabilities that's one business driver you have also to do another way another business driver could be to develop new technology and transform your business model company so going from uh, home region focus process specialist again to product innov innovator and multi-regional global players extend the portfolio of product like the oems are doing by the way and accelerate new technology adoption like OEM are doing, by the way. A new generation vehicle, it's a lot of opportunity for suppliers. Now we are no longer talking about, again, combustion engine. We are talking about electrical. We are talking about lightweight body. We are talking about battery, about very difficult, not difficult, very dif different type of chassis. Uh, we are talking about the battery casing, very important. We are talking talking about HVAC for the um, because the cooling uh, is not the same or the heating is not the same. And of course, we are talking about uh, electrical motors or electrical engines. Okay, It's a different, but again, difference does not mean, uh, it, it means opportunities, it means growth. So there are technological breakthroughs which are also helping you to manage this transition or this transformation, IoT, um, if I'm focusing on computer edit design, generative design, I will talk a little bit later on about this one. Flexible manufacturing. Um, my uh, my colleague of Stratasys will for sure uh, focus on 3D printing. It's a big thing. Uh, map and big data, very important. Virtual reality to improve um, the perceived quality when you are doing design review, but also to help the um, on, on in the shop floor the operator to assemble the various complex product and AI to help everyone uh, looking at with deep learning on existing legacy uh, information to, to uh, propose some recommendation to go faster to design a new and innovative product. And there are some Indian government initiatives for the electrical vehicle value chain. Uh, starting in 2020 up to 2024, covering multiple types of uh, components that I just talked about, like gearboxes, motor, DC, DC, AC, AC, DC converter, battery cells, and so on and so on. So your, your, your country is also helping uh, you, the, uh, the local um, automotive or TNM uh, supply chain. Now, if I go and take my DASO system um, cap, no longer the uh, consultant cap, um, talking about the, the market and the TNM industry. Uh, that's a system uh, as a platform called 3D Experience. Uh, and in the platform, in the 3D Experience platform, we are marketing, we are developing our solution based on industry needs. We are today on transportation mobility, but we are also covering 11 other industries, such as aerospace and defense, high tech, industrial equipment, just to name a few. Now, if I focus on transportation mobility, we have developed an offer, a set of solutions, uh, which are put together uh, in what we call industry solution, solution experience and industry process experience. To make a long story short, you might have, you might go, for example, uh, you are in a company doing uh, electromobility uh, vehicles, you might select the electro electromobility accelerator industry solution experience. And inside this experience, you will have different industry process which are in fact addressing multiple people in the company from engineering to uh, stress analysis, to um, preparation of the manufacturing, to manufacturing itself, to procurement, after sales um, and uh, marketing, for example. So we really try to provide a solution tailored for the, 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 what the company is doing or what the company is valuing the most. And then 
we target the roles of, um, of our solution to a given profile of, um, of user. So one thing which is very important, a big, big change is this fact of, um, of having um, more and more electronics and software inside the, inside the car. <laughs> or to be able to develop the car. Okay, so it's a very, very um, quickly changing technology. So you have to, to master this quick change. Uh, as you know, um, it's pe people are more and more going after autonomous vehicle. There are a lot, because of that, there are a lot of new regulation of safety standards, which are different from one country to another. And um, you, you need uh, to, to be able to develop new business model. Uh, and those business models are connected and are most of them online services. So electronics and software is key. Another thing which is key, because electronics and software is like a tool, is more a method. And the method is system engineering. You have to move out of textual specification, uh, Excel sheet, PowerPoint, PDF, to a really model-based system engineering approach, where you will define the requirements, the functional description of the, the, what the product should do, the logical ar architecture that you selected among other to fulfill those uh, requ requirements and the functional specification. And then at the end, you have the, the physical, the, as a CATIA user, the 3D model of, of, of CATIA, for example. So, and this is the only way, the only way to master the complexity of what is now a product, especially in TNM, especially combining mechanical, electrical, electronics and software you need to really so but you, you are not forced to start you know and overnight and go from textual to system you can go step by step and we have dedicated solution in the street experience platform to help you do, to do that so most of our customers 85 percent of the world's electrical vehicle um, were made and are made using the system virtual te twin technology what means virtual twin it's a digital twin of the, the, the vehicle, including not only the mechanical aspect, the car body, the engine, whatever, but also the electronics, the software, and, and the, the behavior of, uh, and the validation by analysis, okay? So it's quite important to, add, to try to achieve, even if it's for just a subcomponent, this virtual twin representation of the product that you will deliver to your customer. Very important, this uh, digit digitalization of both the, the, the assets, but also the processes, help you to reduce uh, the costly prototypes, help, help you to reduce also most of the physical testing. You, you will do virtual testing, and the physical testing will almost be just a validation of all those virtual testing uh, which have been uh, run up front. You will shorten the lead time, reduce the cost, reduce the vehicle recalls, or the equipment recalls, and um, there is also a cost down lowering uh, because you are using lightweight body design with EV batteries, um, and those are indispensable to the development of autonomous transportation. So, and 3D experience connect the dots between all those sustainable domains. Finally, if I now zoom a little bit more on a particular area, um, they are, as you know, too lightweight. Lightweight is one of the challenge as system engineering, as software management, as mechatronics. Um, but uh, on, the, let's say, the mechanical side, uh, lightweight engineering uh, can be achieved. You can reduce the weight of a product by, in fact, different manners. The most obvious is uh, material. You believe uh, if you use composite instead of aluminum, it will be lighter. If you use aluminum instead of steel, it will be lighter. That's obvious. To use uh, to optimize the geometry of your product, it's also one way uh, using topology optimization, uh, generative design tools. I will show you a quick, quick example. It's one way. It's more and more common now to use that, whatever the uh, industry and especially in the transportation and mobility industries. Uh, the manufacturing process. If you use hydroforming versus milling, obviously the part is hollow. It's lighter than the plain part. If you use a conformal cooling in a plastic injection molding or die casting, you can have much more lighter thickness or smaller thickness, so the part will be lighter. Same for stamping. If you use uh, additive manufacturing, you might also create much more or produce for small serial or, or tooling equipment or customization parts 
in the vehicle, you can use, uh, you can be faster and lighter uh, by using, for example, special polymer instead of metal. So, and what is important is also to manage uh, the, the development during the development of your product, whatever its complexity, but probably more for complex uh, assemblies, uh, the weight during, because there are so many players which are maybe adding weight to the final product. So you can monitor uh, and you need to monitor those, the weight uh, of your product during the development. And one uh, important topic as well is to uh, have this model-based definition approach where the 3D model contains all the information, not only the 3D CAD model, but all the manufacturing information by 3D tolerancing, notes, text, which are in the 3D model. And you no longer use um, papers or drawings. You just use them and make some print of the 3D model, some screenshot from the 3D model for compliance or legal reasons, because some, sometimes you still need papers. And the good news is that in the 3D experience, especially in Katia, I am a Katia guy, it's written here, uh, especially in Katia, we have the, this uh, technological um, pieces uh, to do that. We have dedicated uh, roles for composite, for hydroforming sheet metal, for stamping die, mold and tooling, um, if you use, for example, our fastener tool, you will be able to glue together components instead of riveting or instead of welding. And of course, glue is lighter than rivets. So again, the joining technique is important, is important for the light weighting. You have a dedicated tool to monitor the uh, weight and center of gravity of your product during the development. Um, that's a dedicated solution. You, thanks to the knowledge, you can make checks at a given step of your design to see if you are still on target regarding the weight. 3D Master helps you to, to achieve this uh, paperless um, process uh, and design. And um, community oriented design, simulation driven design, we call that ModSim, mod, 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 modelization and simulation, very, very uh, tightly integrated together. And even, even reverse engineering is important because you might have very legacy a uh, proven legacy uh, product or tooling that you would like to, why not optimize uh, in terms of weight or whatever. So you need, unfortunately, to re to scan your uh, legacy uh, uh, physical product or tooling and reconstruct them to be able to then use the 3D model to use the nice uh, pieces of technology uh, for reducing the weight. Good solution, and this is available in, in Katia. So just a, it will be my solid, my only video of the uh, of the presentation. So I would just take an hydraulic block, manifold block. You see a multiple channel, and I would like to generate a, a block which is optimized in terms of weight, but also optimized in terms of pressure drop of all those uh, veins. And I will quickly show you how by using um, generative design in Kutia we can do that. So. We start by the fluid uh, generative design. So the idea is to minimize the pressure drop of all those channels. I have my block. I am more here interested in the duct shape. Okay. I will define the nature of the fluid. Um, I will define the inlet um, velocity. I will define the outlet uh, expected pressure and uh, give just a starting volume and run this uh, generative design, flow-driven generative design optimization. And I will optimize the shape of my vein to minimize recirculation um, and get a shape which is, again, minimizing also the pressure drop. So I do that. Here we can see how the fluid is moving uh, across the, the duct. And I can uh, check that uh, my um, hydraulic block is behaving the proper way. And then from this uh, fluid generative optimized design, I will go now to do the structural generative design to reduce uh, the casing like, uh, weight. So I take the uh, pressure coming from the, the fluid flowing in the duct as, a, as a, an input, as a constraint. Uh, I take the material of the, of the part of the casing and I will run my uh, structural uh, optimization to reduce um, the weight. This is the result of the optimization. And then, thanks to Katia, we can easily reconstruct the CAD model that will be either casting or 3D printing or milled. Uh, we have various ways of redesigning the part depending on the manufacturing process, which is uh, selected to actually produce the part. As you can see, very nice stuff. And 37% average pressure drop and a lot of gain on the weight of the part.
And you can do similar things, maybe only the topology optimization from a structural design on many, many other parts or tooling in your assembly line or in the, your shop floor. Uh, and because those tooling are not big numbers and they can be even 3D printed and maybe polymer can replace uh, um, metal for those toolings. So it's very, very nice technology. Finally, this MOTIM approach, uh, what does it mean? It means that you have a first CAD model, you make an analysis, so mesh, um, meshing, um, boundary condition, loads, whatever, you run your simulation, everything is fine. So you are okay for the first time, but as you know, life is life. You, there are multiple changes occurring during the life, uh, the development of the product. So how to speed up the, um, the analysis of a, a similar design, okay? And this is typically what the, uh, what we call engineering template in Katia and Simulia, which is a, the brand for our uh, CAE analysis uh, solution, can, can help you to do that. And again, in this particular case, you do it once, you create a template, and you can then reuse the template combining and automating all the tasks of pre-processing for the, the computation and computation of the CAE analysis and, and reuse this template. Now let's do another type and it will finish my presentation uh, is um, multi-physics. You are now in charge of developing a performing uh, electrical motor. Uh, this is it. But of course, a, a motor is not only uh, mechanical, it's also um, uh, there are also some um, electrical uh, design aspect, electromagnetic um, simulation. So you can combine multiple uh, physics, stress simulation, electromagnetic simulation, and combine and optimize them thanks to our orchestration tool called the Process Composer. And designing um, multiple uh, alternatives, you will be able to optimize your engine to the, for the stress from a stress point of view and also from an electromagnetic point of view. So you start from the engineering, then you do different type of meshing because it's not the same type of finite element model when you do a structural mesh and when, well, sorry, when you do a structural analysis or an electromagnetic analysis, you run the optimization, you get here the result of the simulation, you change some parameters, you loop, and at the end, from the orchestration, you have now the new set of parameters for your engine, some dimension, but also uh, uh, some time angles, stuff like that. And then you will be able to feed this, um, the updated requirements to your design to update the CATIA, for example, CATIA parametric model of your engine with, because you have now the right parameters. And then you will be able to, why not, also optimize the housing around uh, your electrical engine. So to finish, because it works to finish. The 3D Experiment platform has been adopted by um, a lot of customers. Most of you probably in India are using Katia V5, which is an excellent product, but 3D Experience Katia and 3D Experiment platform extend the scope by integrating multi-physics simulation, by integrating system engineering, by integrating the manufacturing, by integrating um, software programming, so, and it's why those customers uh, moved from V5 to 3D experience, like the PSA group, now it's Stellantis, like Renault, like uh, Bosch, like uh, even Toyota for the platform. Uh, Tesla is, uh, is, is also using, the, um, was using Katia V5 and is now also using 3D experience Katia. So uh, PSA, it was tough because they also acquire Opel and they have to move Opel and move them from where they were in the past, another software to, to Katia. So Renault, now they have 18,000 users in production, some of them, and the most innovative department is even on the cloud. Toyota is using the platform to manage also the legacy data. Bosch is using model-based system uh, engineering for car multimedia uh, readiness to extend and scale. And uh, Tesla is also adopting uh, both 3D Experience Katia and uh, our platform for global collaboration um, target. And we have also a customer adopting this uh, platform uh, in truck and bus. The best one is Ashok Leland in India. Okay, thanks to them. I don't know if you are in the call, but hello guys. Uh, but also Scania, uh, Volvo. Uh, we have some other smaller company like Iriza or Marco Polo, but even Tesla is do, are developing their truck with a 3D experience platform for various um, point of view, for various targets, because it, it's not, a, a truck is not like a car. 
a truck from Scania is not is very very modular. It's not like a truck from uh, Volvo, Volvo, for example. And uh, what is nice to hear, at least for me as a Katia fan, is that the top worldwide electrical vehicle startups, Tesla, Rivian, Nio, Weltmeister, Nikola, Xpeng, Faraday, Lucid, Proterra, are using 3D Experience Katia. Only one is using Katia V5 <laughs> in China. Uh, but there are also some other guys using uh, 3D Experience Katia, um, like uh, Renault, I was mentioning it, Kenu, Lightyear, uh, Rimac, this question, um, the faster electrical car in, in the world, Chrysler, and, and um, some other customer. And finally, uh, I think I'm, I hope I'm on time. I would like uh, to thank you very, very much for your attention. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Thank Daniel, you, Daniel, for such a wonderful presentation. Um, and, uh, since we are a little little ahead of time, uh, we will take one question. A lot yeah. of questions have come up in the chat. The question I'd like to, the question that has come uh, is uh, is that medium and small enterprise sector are facing a lot of financial trouble post COVID. How do you think uh, uh, the this sector can make use of digital manufacturing and technology uh, uh, integration to reduce the cost burden and come back to profitability? What in Europe, it's like everywhere in the world. Every everyone is suffering. Big guys, small guys, medium guys. Okay. Um, the good news is that, it's my view, the countries, the government made of, all of them, it's, I know in France, I know in North of America, but I'm sure in India, they, they really invest money to help those companies to transform themselves. When you have a crisis, it's the right time to transform yourself. Otherwise, you are me too. You will be better, 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 but not that much better. And crisis is... is PSA was in V5, they moved to 3D experience, they were almost in bankruptcy, but they, it was when they were uh, in front of the wall that they decided to jump and not just step by step go on, on the wall, okay? So, and it's the same, I'm, so because the go, and government is funding, give money to all companies, not only in transportation mobility, but the one who are most suffering, which is transportation mobility and uh, aerospace and defense, gave them money to change their tool, to digitalize their process and change their tool to allow them to be able to stay in the train. And we are, we are lucky for that All because right. they are buying our software. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, we will take the rest of the questions after the panel discussion. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you so much once again, Mr. Daniel. Uh, My pleasure. Lovely presentation. Uh, there's so many questions popping in. Uh, I think now let's move to the next speaker, Mr. Bush. I just you to introduce Mr. Yeah, Vishek. Yeah, thank you. So our next speaker is Mr. Jan Rigel, uh, who is head of manufacturing BU sales EMEA and Asia at Stratasys. Jan Rigel has a master degree in mechanical engineering and M he's an MBA. He started his career working in the automotive industry, performing design analysis on internal combustion engines before moving into sales. Joining Stratasys in May 2015 as a strategic account manager, he now heads the team in charge of delivering additive manufacturing solutions across EMEA region. He leads Stratasys into the rail industry by obtaining the fire, smoke and toxicity certification EN4545-2 for their 3D printed materials. Very interesting. Obtaining a highly commended award in the annual Railway Industry Innovation Awards held in London on 28th June 2019. So a very accomplished speaker. Uh, I will hand over now to uh, Jan. Over to you, Jan. Thank you. Mr. Ghosh for the very kind introduction. I think it was excellent. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, one of the colleagues will be sharing my presentation. So I will now uh, start and uh, ask you to move to the next slide. Uh, thank you very much for your support and help. It's very much appreciated. So today I would like to take you through this presentation where I'm going to be talking about the key challenges that we are facing within the, the supply chain. I think you know it's not just in India. I think it's a worldwide issue. Uh, first of all, COVID is, is really, uh, you know, a, a really um, big issue for everybody. And uh, we know that, uh, you know, particularly India recently uh, has been really badly affected. 
Um, however, you know, there's also other issues like, uh, you know, shipping, availability of container, and uh, we've seen the issue with the Suez Canal as well, which, uh, you know, has been uh, adding to, to, the, to the problem. So if we can move to the next slide, please. In the next slide, you will see that actually 75% uh, of the business uh, surveyed uh, have experienced issue with supply chain. You know, long lead time for, for uh, you know, start of production, uh, lack of spare parts, uh, customer uh, demand, uh, you know, and lack of flexibility as well. Uh, impact on the environment uh, for long, long distance shipping is also becoming an issue for many, many companies. So if you can move into the next slide, we will then look at what today, you know, ma most of the manufacturing process is about. Manufacturing is typically very centralized in a single facility, uh, typically that to try to drive costs down. But sometimes the issue is that you are far from your end customer. And as we saw recently, it's uh, creating some issues. Um, what we see if you move into the next slide is actually additive manufacturing enable you to print locally. You can actually centralize all the design activity uh, and create a digital inventory, meaning you can, for instance, scan your spare parts and create a virtual file, a CAD file, for instance, using uh, DASO software, and uh, you can easily create and put those into the cloud. This can then be accessed. Let's say you want to manufacture for one of your customer in Germany um, and you have all the design facility in India, Easily, the CAD can be generated here and then printed next to your customer with a printer located in Germany. If we move into the next slide, I will explain to you what is a typical uh, flow here. So as you can see, we take an example here from a site in North America where they are creating the file and actually the printer is located in Germany. What they will be able to do is you grab CAD print uh, as a software, which is a, a strategy software, they can create a CMB file, which is basically providing you the orientation and all the detail on how to print the part. This file can then be encrypted, sent through the cloud to a printer located in a different country, and then unlocked and then printed on demand. And that's really, really game changer for many, many industries. We have also API or interfaces, which enables us to work with third party software, uh, for instance, if you wish to uh, develop an MPI, we have a software development kit which enable uh, you know, to uh, have an interface, for instance, for software like DASO system and will enable you to, for instance, uh, have access to the printer as part of your MES software or PLM software. If you can move into the next slide, please. So this is basically you know, looking at the different aspects of the design process and manufacturing. You start with the design, engineering, you obviously look at uh, manufacturing aids, jigs and fixtures and tooling and production. Stratasys now has five technology. We used to have two technology until very recently. So we've made acquisition, but also developed new product in house. So jetting like polyjet is one of the Stratasys technologies. Stereolithography or SLA is also a Stratasys technology now. We have low end FFF printer using the MakerBot Brown also available. We have the well-known fuse deposition modeling or FDM, which is really established, typically very good for you know, manufacturing edge, jigs and fixtures, uh, but also some low volume production in the hundreds. We have also acquired a company from the US called Origin, who make DLP parts, probably where the cost point is both in the thousands of parts, and probably the most uh, breakthrough technology, which is a, a part of a joint venture between Stratasys and SAR in the UK. Is called SAF or selective absorption fusion. And this can be really suitable to make tens of thousands of parts within the vehicle. And I will show you later on uh, some applications. So today we'll focus on two technologies, FDM for jigs and fixtures and SAF for spare parts and medium body production. Next slide, please. As you can see, why FDM? Actually, FDM is a technology which is 30 years old, invented by Stratasys. Scott Crumb, the founder of the company, invented this technology. So we have developed a lot of IP around it. As you can see, more than 1,200 patents related to this technology. If you move into the next slide, here is an overview of what can be done with a single FDM Fortus printer. From prototyping for large parts, functional prototyping, marketing models, but also many applications in the jigs and fixtures, like CNC fixtures, uh, assembly tool, uh, for instance, fixture to do 3D scanning, gauges, 
composite layer tools, and also some metal path replacement with their outstanding nylon 12 carbon fiber, which is 30% uh, carbon fiber content within the, the nylon uh, material. Um, and also some low volume path, as you can see here, it's a path for a, U a new AV for camera housing, which is actually an, an end use path used today on some application. We have many actually uh, customer in India uh, using a technology like Ashok Leyland, for instance, Mahindra. Uh, we have Minda as well in the tier one suppliers. Many of the big uh, OEMs like uh, Volkswagen Skoda, also based in India, are using and General Motors are using our technology uh, to do prototyping and uh, some of the jigs and fixtures as well. Moving on to the next slide, please. So here I would like also to focus on the jigs and fixtures of really what is really important for most of the automotive company, automation and lean manufacturing. If you click on the next slide, please, I will show you an example of this and of our tool, which is actually a gripper, where vacuum goes through the suction cup, as you can see, so this vacuum suction cup, metal insert, and this part with the you know high carbon fiber content, high density, in exceptional elongation to break, uh, really good isotropic properties, knowing that FDM is typically not a very isotropic process. We have actually the best isotropic mechanical properties in the market. And this is actually a really lightweight tool, which we see lightweight on a robot means you can go faster or you can actually downgrade the size of your robot and reduce the cost. This is really very important for any manufacturing site. Moving on into the next slide, please. As you can see here, it's an example with Siemens in Germany, where this time they are handling electronic components. So we have ESD safe or electrostatic dissipative material, which are safe to handle electronic components. And this is uh, what they've been printing. It's actually the gripper uh, at the end of the robot are actually printed with their ABS ESD7. If you move into the next slide, please. Another example of a great application is, this is an example of CNC. So with CNC, sometimes people put CNC against 3D printing. I think it can be, but most of the time, actually, we can support CNC more than actually compete with the technology. Um, we can actually use CNC for fixtures, where actually when you need to machine a part, you also need to machine the fixture, which is a lost time and production time for your, C your CNC machining. By being able to print the fixtures in parallel of actually doing the, the machining, you actually save time and money. And with the 912 carbon fiber, with a compressive strength of 900 bars, you can actually handle parts very effectively and very, it's very easy to generate them as well because you can start directly from the final part CAD file and automatically generate the feature from it. Moving on into the next slide, please. And a great example here. This is a tool uh, used by General Motors and, or Chevrolet in the US. And it's a rear wheel hemming tool. So it's a very large tool actually, uh, which fits in our uh, largest FDM uh, system. Uh, it's about, you know, the weight of this tool is actually 14 kilogram printing in a safe. Before it was in aluminum and it was 34 kilograms. So we have achieved a 20 kilogram weight saving. So weight reduction is about 56%, lead time saving between 70 and 77%, and cost saving, which is huge here, is 74% saving. So it's very, very easy to achieve payback on jigs and fixtures and tubing with the FDM system. Moving on into the next slide, please. Here, this is a transition slide to introduce uh, some examples of spare parts on demand. So if you move into the next slide, please. We, I showed you before this slide about you know, the, the way you can, from a, a site maybe in India or a site in North America, send a job to Germany, for instance. This is what actually Siemens Mobility is already doing. It's not just we are saying maybe in the future, it's already happening. Siemens Mobility, which is a, a major rail operator or, or rolling stock uh, operator, had a major issue in terms of spare parts. They don't know when those spare parts will be needed. They have to store them in warehouses, which cost them a huge amount of money. They were able to reduce their lead time by 95% using Stratasys F900, as you can see on the picture. And this is actually a screenshot of their, uh, of their web page. So today, you know, suppliers or, or customers of uh, Siemens can go into this web page and then order this, for instance, USB cover if they wish to. 
If you move to the next slide, I will show you a couple of more examples. This is actually a tramway uh, front bumper, which is made in three sections. And typically, there is a lot of debris, stones impact into this part, which damage it, and it needs to be replaced. As you can see on the right-hand side, it's a screenshot of the uh, website again, and you can actually select one of the panel or all of them. And then as soon as the order is received by Siemens, they will send the digital file straight away to the 3D printer, and this part will be shipped to you. And they are actually saving time by doing that compared to traditional manufacturing process and money as well, which is very important. So customer satisfaction goes up and it makes their business leaner and more efficient. And they have actually multiple F900 to do this throughout uh, their, uh, their network. If you move on into the next slide, please. So here is a great example of a part, which is actually a spare part, which used to be made of aluminum for chocolate factory. And as you can see, this part here can be printed in 49 minutes. It's actually 83% cost saving, and the return on investment for the printer is less than six months. This is a great example, and actually, it's working even better than the previous part because they were able to uh, add some features to it very easily and do a couple of iterations by printing the first part, testing it, and within hours and within a day, they could actually find a, a solution for the production floor. Next slide, please. Here is another example from a company well known within the oil and gas industry, uh, John Crane. Uh, it's a worldwide company. And they actually are printing spare parts, as you can see, the impeller and the uh, mixing device for the fluid was made initially made of 22 components. By using design for additive, they were able to integrate those components into one part. And because we use a soluble support, it's very easy to make parts which can move or very intricate where you normally cannot remove the support. But actually, with this with our solution, they were able to achieve a 98% cheaper spare part, but also save a huge amount of time to get this part and make the product work again. Next slide, please. And then here, I will show you a video. It's not an automotive customer. However, it's an experienced customer who is used to our large format printers, and who is going to talk to us about our latest FDM printer. By the way, this printer is priced under $100,000. It's really, really attractive product.
Thank you. And I can add that actually this customer has now uh, invested into this uh, printer. The video was done during the beta phase and they were actually extremely satisfied. So um, I think it's a testimony to the strategy team who is doing all the development uh, for the quality of the product. So I would like to move now into the SAF technology, or as I mentioned, selective absorption fusion, which is a, a strategy technology um, for volume production. So we focus more on the jigs and fixtures prototyping before. Now let's move into real production parts. So we have a video here just to explain what this technology is about, and then I will show you some example for the automotive industry. Thank you. So if we move on into the next slide, you will see that uh, some of the typical uh, you know, applications, we, we see you know, P11, which is actually uh, a very green material because it doesn't come from petroleum. It comes actually from castor oil, uh, which is you know, really good for the environment as well. Parts with moving components like clips, brackets, are, are, works very well. We, we also can do really uh, very dense parts so if you need a you know, thick wall as well, our process have really good thermal management and will provide you excellent uh, part quality and very uh, limited uh, deformation compared to other technology on the market today. Robust and bulky parts as well is one of the things we can do extremely well. Um, and you, know, you have obviously some limitation with any powder technology, which is the powder removal, but except that you have a huge amount of freedom in terms of the, the geometry. And that's really, really where you can, uh, you know, apply some of the principles that uh, the previous speaker was mentioning about light rating of the part. You know, it's additive manufacturing using topology software can really be optimized and be made much, much lighter weight and therefore very cost effective uh, compared to other um, technology. You can also integrate component together, which is really important. So if we move into the next slide, I will show you some real example of uh, automotive application. So here you can see, for instance, uh, bumper brackets can be really good part. Some plugs, caps, underhood application like you know uh, filter housing, grills, bracket, um, electronic or electrical connectors, uh, rear bumper sensors, clip for the electrical wiring loom, side mirrors. That's all you know. Some example of parts that you can actually print, uh, you know, for within the outside of the vehicle. If you move into the next slide, I will show you some example of um, interior parts. So one of the things you can really easily do is if we look at the side panels on the left hand side, we can actually add texture and texture doesn't cost anything. 
If you want to add texture in injection molding, typically you will have to add cost in the, in the process to the mold and the intricacy of the mold. Here, you don't have that. You know, the, what is really driving the cost per part is the amount of material being used. And actually, if you change the surface, uh, it doesn't really impact the, the amount of material being used. Uh, that's really a, a really big benefit of 3D printing. You can really customize your part very easily. You can print cup holders, uh, brackets, ventilation grill, handles, mirror cover, sensor covers, fan, speaker grills. All those are potential uh, parts that can be 3D printed with the technology. And when we talk about production, we talk about you know tens of thousands of parts. Maybe not hundreds of thousands, but definitely in the tens of thousands, you can be very cost effective. So it can work for both direct production, where you launch a new vehicle and you want to use it as a bridge to production, or for spare parts as well. Or you have, for instance, niche vehicle, which are actually will not be sold more than 50,000 uh, units a year. And those will be definitely uh, parts we can look at and really optimize to uh, bring you uh, cost and time benefit. If we look at the next slide, I often hear about injection molding you know, being much, much cheaper. But let's not forget that when you start production, you need to get the injection mold first. That can take eight to 12 weeks. And I would say in the current uh, crisis, we see the supply chain, we are probably exceeding that uh, by a long way. Which means that during this time, you can actually already have started from day one your production within the printer. And actually, sorry. Um, and actually, if you look at uh, the um, number here, uh, we can actually, within eight to 12 weeks, print between 14 and 21,000 parts, which is with a 70% utilization. Over a 12 month period, we could print, we can, uh, sorry, print over 84,000 parts. That's a game changer. You wouldn't have started to print the first part and you potentially would have 20 parts in your hand with this process. That's really important to consider. And obviously we are assuming here that the injection mold will come out First time, correct. They won't do any remanufacturing of the mold. While with our process, obviously the first batch will be printed in 12 hours, any defect will be picked up in the first 12 hours, which means that you can easily modify the part if you need to, and the next day have the correct part. That's a game changer in terms of launch and production and give you a flexibility in addition you can also customize those parts. So let's say we talk about a, a dashboard panel and you want to offer uh, customization or different texture or different logo uh, to your uh, customers. This is something now you can charge for as an extra service. And now we start seeing company uh, which are starting to adopt that technology. For instance, uh, BMW is already doing that with Stratasys technology in China, for instance, uh, using Polyjet technology, so another technology, but definitely SAF wasn't launched at the time and SAF has only been launched uh, in April this year. So it's a new technology which offer huge amount of opportunity moving forward for uh, low volume production and customization for your customers. I believe that's my final slide. If you can move into the final slide. And uh, maybe I can, if we have time, I'm happy to take any questions. Uh Thank you so very much, Jan, for that uh, lovely presentation. Uh, one very important takeaway from that presentation is, and that's a question that came in a lot as well, that so far 3D printing has always been thought as a prototyping tool. But with technologies like SAF and P3, we are moving towards production. And a very important point that I take away is that while the tooling suppliers are making the tool ready, the production and the delivery must not stop. And technologies like SAF and the capacity to produce tens of thousands of parts in, in, in days to early weeks and not months can enable the Indian suppliers to start producing and supplying from day one. One of the questions that came, which is a question that we hear quite often, is, is 3D printing affordable? And how to make it more and more affordable? If you're going to answer that question, Jan. Yes, I think, uh, you know, with technology like SARS, the, the cost per part is really going down compared to FDM. Uh, FDM has sometimes better mechanical properties which are suitable and required for jigs and fixtures and tooling. Uh, also, the size of the part is, is significantly larger as well. And you can achieve you know, parts uh, more than a meter, uh, especially with our new F770, we have a, a very large big volume. Uh, so, you know, the, the SAF will be more for the what I would call the small to medium sized part, 
but the cost per part is significantly lower than traditional technology. And that's why we are, when we are talking about the volume production, FDM is suitable for the hundreds, maybe a thousand parts, uh, while SAF will be in the tens of thousands. And we are, we are looking at comparing traditional technology with uh, the SAF technology here. And that's really the, the change. And what we would like to do is anybody who would like to investigate if you know, they have a part or some application, we are very happy to, to receive parts and do a cost analysis to compare traditional technology with our cost within this technology. And I think you may be surprised with what you can achieve, especially if you can uh, nest within the build volume of the printer, different part size and really have a high uh, nesting density. That's the best way to lower your cost per part. Uh, thank you so much, Jan, for answering that question. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the presentation and start uh, an exciting part for this session, which is on the panel discussion. Um, um, may I request Mr. Daniel to come uh, online now? And uh, yeah, we, will start the, the, we will start the panel discussion. Can somebody allow me to share my screen, please? Uh, can somebody from the admin allow me to share yes. my screen? Yeah, it will get done. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Uh, lovely. Uh, so, uh, 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 the first question, uh, and then we can open the house for debate. Uh, uh, Abhishek, uh, just uh, give me, yeah, just give me one minute before you start. No problem. No problem. Meanwhile, yeah. to the rest of the participants, I hope you have enjoyed the presentation. We will have a Q&A round after the panel discussion, so you can keep typing your questions. So the question is to Mr. Perna Ghosh. Once uh, again, uh, Abhishek, just, large... Abhishek, just hold hold no for problem. one minute. Yeah, 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 yeah. No Thank problem. you. Thank you. Let me know when you're so ready. So now, now we are, you know, starting the panel discussion. Uh, the panel discussion will be, uh, you know, participated by uh, three speakers. Mr. Jan Regel from Stratasys, Mr. Daniel Isaac from Deso Systems, and myself, I'm part of Unominda Group. It will be moderated by Mr. Abhishek Kalra, who is Associate Vice President for Altim Technologies. So about Abhishek, a few, a few lines about him. Abhishek Kalra is the Associate Vice President at Altim Technologies, overseeing application engineering, product management, and pre-sales operations for digital manufacturing and digitization business units. Uh, Abhishek has conducted technical consulting projects uh, with clients of various countries such, such as South Africa, India, Saudi Arabia, and Namibia. Uh, I will request all the participant members if you have any questions, and uh, as Abhishek already shared, please put it in the uh, Q&A section. Over to you, Abhishek. Thank you. Thank you so much for the for a lovely introduction. Uh, and uh, the, the first question I'd like to ask is to Mr. Ghosh itself. Uh, Mr. Bosch, you are leading India's one of India's largest automotive supplier groups. How much prepared do you feel is the Indian ecosystem in adopting the advanced uh, technology integration that Daniel and Jan have spoke about? What are the key gaps that we need to fill to exploit the complete impact of such technologies? First of all, uh, let me thank uh, and appreciate the presentation by Jan. Uh, it was really very informative. Uh, highly technological and also many things uh, which we are seeing uh, today, uh, which are advancement of the engineering, uh, you know, innovations happening across the globe. These are all part of the portfolios. I think great presentation, Jan. Thank you so much. Uh, so before I jump into your question of affordability, and if you can just uh, bring the question on the front, I think that will really help me. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, I just want to put certain you know aspects uh, from. Uh, the, the supplier industry, or as we say, the ACMA members, what we today face. So today, if you look at the ACMA uh, community or the ACMA members, uh, we are grappling with the problem of, uh, you know, the kind of uh, change in uh, the customer, uh, you know, expectations or the, the customer behavioral change, which is happening. It may be de uh, depending on technology. It may be depending on the the regulations, it can be depending on the, the recessions which are going on uh, for a very long time. It can be depending on the, the pandemic situations which are which are going on at this point of time. So the customer choice is one of the biggest issue which the, all the members uh, organizations are grappling with this point of time. Second biggest issue is uh, supply of parts. Uh, 
because that is one of the biggest issues at this point of time in terms of supply chain disruption. Third is obviously cost escalations in terms of raw material prices and other things. Fourth is obviously managing cash flows and, you know, managing our business in a very healthy manner. So I think looking at all these four uh, macroeconomic uh, issues, uh, we need to understand how technology can really help us in grappling those problems and also leapfrog ourselves as an industry to reach around 75 billion dollars uh, as, as a whole i mean which was planned uh, around 24 25. one thing we have to understand india is on the verge of a technological transformation so one side we are talking about aces which is autonomous connected electric and shared mobility Another side we are talking about, you know, largely about the regulatory uh, norms which are coming up on a frequent basis from the government and the Ministry of, you know, heavy industries and uh, the transport uh, departments. Third is the customer choice, extremely important. The customer choice is also changing on a very, very rapid manner. So people are looking at uh, the autonomous cars, at least semi-autonomous cars with a lot of sensors and features and other things. And at the same time, electric mobility will also be, you know, one of the major, major disruptors in future days to come. Looking at all these disruptions and the changes which are happening, it is very, very important that we really leapfrog the way Germany or USA is looking at technological uh, interventions and, you know, adoption in their businesses. Now, the, the major uh, four or five, you know, the KPIs or I will say the business cases, which are very, very important. How to reduce expenses in introducing these technologies in our operations? Point number one, through digital manufacturing uh, adoption, how can we really bring in visibility and transparency in the customer processes? Say, for an example, today, customer gives me a drawing or I design something for him. How can we build in transparency and accuracy and also visibility to the customer so that he gets that confidence that, yeah, this supplier is the right choice for me for the future, you know, uh, trends. Third is uh, how can we reduce the time to market process? That's extremely important. Today, the, the, the rotation of products or the change in uh, the products is very, very frequent. And you know, the life cycle of a product has also come down earlier, which, which was 10 years, came down to five years, three years. And now it is mostly six months. In every six months, there are change management change uh, is happening, which is nothing but engineering changes or process changes or design changes or any kind of changes. Fourth is, uh, I just touched upon, but I can just elaborate slightly on the customer satisfaction and confidence. So how can we generate repeat orders, repeat business? So that means it will impact my top line. So once I create confidence, I also create repeat business for my business. And it also helps me in sustainability for the future. Last but not the least is basically uh, keeping yourself ahead of competition. If you do not adopt technologies in today's time, maybe our neighbors or anybody else in the whole world will, will beat us very, 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 very fast. You know, uh, Government of India has brought this uh, incentive scheme for all the organizations across MSMEs and large enterprises. Now, what is uh, incentive? Incentive is linked with innovation. When I have innovative products, when I have faster uh, turnaround time, we, when you have fa faster you know, customer satisfaction uh, life cycles, we can definitely convert our technology uh, investments into business, into revenues, into cost reductions, and also efficiency and speed. I think these are the advantages we will get in technology adoption. It is high time now Indian auto industry, including the ancillary industry, whether it is tier one, two, three, four, adopt this industry 4.0 technologies. 3D printing being one of the major, major, uh, you know, uh, impactful businesses. I will say 3D printing linked with your PLM system, linked with IoT and artificial intelligence can bring in a huge revolution in the entire ecosystem. And we can definitely uh, look forward and go, go ahead with the innovations and the customer satisfaction, which we are looking at. Over to you, Abhishek. Thank you. Right. So, uh, Mr. Bosch, you very rightly pointed out the need for technology adoption. Uh, my question is, how well how well prepared do you think India is? Uh, is it, has it already adopted it to a good enough level that we are competing with global uh, OEMs or we still have a long way to go? How do you think we can bridge that gap? See, uh, it's all about, uh, you know, uh, adoption is nothing but uh, a habit and, and the change management. 
you know, many industries in India will still be grappling with industry 1.0 or 2.0. I don't know, maybe you go to remote places. There will be situations where people are using lathe machines or some other machines which do not fit into today's scheme of things. But unless we really leapfrog, so my point is not incremental imp improvement. My point is about leapfrogging the thing. We are talking about $5 billion, you know, uh, GDP or $5 billion economy in by, by 2030 or something like that. Unless and until we leapfrog ourselves. So leapfrogging is extremely important. Cash being one of the major, major issues with all the uh, auto manufacturers at this point of time. We need to really look into the benefits and really make our balance sheet in such a manner so that all the technological interventions really help us in uh, transforming our business. So we have to look at transformation as one of the levers and not really the, the adoption or the, the purpose or, you know, because if we go into that kind of a cycle, I don't think we will be able to leapfrog and and, and there are competition in across, uh, you know, our countries who can definitely beat us very, very fast. So as far as adoption is concerned, uh, from a temperament point of view, this temperament has to go through a change. And I believe ACMA Center of Excellence, ACMA Digital Committee, we are all jointly working towards this, uh, you know, awareness creation, uh, this uh, import, I mean, uh, creating the, you know, member community, the kind of awarenesses for improving technologies, adopting technologies, especially in terms of industry 4.0 for leapfrogging our businesses. Otherwise, we just struggle and then uh, sometime after we will uh, going to be perished. I mean, uh, the, the, the world is going through such a huge uh, space of transformation. Someday we will suddenly see that we are nowhere and we don't, neither make money nor customers are happy nor my products are suitable to the market. So we will be nowhere. Technology has to help us in terms of speeding up the entire uh, innovation and the uh, product lifecycle management process. Thank you. All right. So Very there, well, there is, there, there, Parma, there there is to... basically, uh, let me put it like this. There is basically no choice for us. So this is my last point. Yeah. Thank you. Very well. That's a very well put statement, Mr. Ghosh, that uh, we have already kind of, many of us have already kind of missed the bus. And now we, we cannot afford to walk anymore. We have to run and catch the bus and then exceed it. My follow-up question is to both Daniel and Jan that uh, Mr. Ghosh put up a very important point that many industries, especially in India, cannot afford the full-scale adoption. What is Dasso and Stratasys doing to make sure that there are solutions available for everybody in limited budgets that can help them to get up to speed? So one by one, you could take these questions. We'll start. So um, first of all, what we have to... First of all, if I'm talking about uh, the 3 Experience platform and, and uh, 3 Experience Katia, it's really, really, it was designed from the very beginning to be scalable, to address small, medium business, big guys, one guy company in the French forest, wherever, or in India. So you have multiple, it's scalable, you can start small, you have to think big, but you can start small, you can add other uh, capabilities on top of, for example, the core mechanical modeling capability of Katia. This can be on the cloud, you don't have any IT guys. Everything is saved on the cloud. You just need a small laptop. You can connect an, an internet line. You can even have now the, what I call the baby Katia. Baby Katia, you can do decent mechanical stuff, um, solid modeling, surface modeling, assembly modeling, without any software installed on your laptop. You just need an internet browser, and everything is on the cloud. So and. Um, you can rent the software, you can buy the software and just pay maintenance. You can uh, have, um, you can add at any time a particular uh, add-on on top of core mechanical because for a certain amount of time you, you have some business around electrical or whatever. So it's very scalable, uh, it's affordable, the return investment is very quick and uh, it's on the cloud, it's on, it can be on-premise. We have some customer on premise, mainly the, the large accounts. But you, you, you saw in my uh, in my presentation, the, the innovation lab of Renault is on the cloud. So it's not the only one. More and more big guys are thinking about the cloud. So it's very simple to install, very simple to maintain, very scalable, and it's affordable. Look, we are not usually people say, "Oh, Katia is very expensive." Katia is bringing the value for the money you pay, but uh, it is not. It's very affordable. Uh, on behalf of Avishek, can I ask a question to both Daniel and Jan? 
Yeah, uh, sure, sir. Yeah, yeah. So just one question, you know, there are very small organizations or supplier community members who are really, you know, very small organizations, 50 crore turnover, 50 crore Indian rupees, or you can say 500 million Indian rupees or 1000 million Indian rupees, 1 billion Indian rupees, very small, small companies are there. So, uh, do you have any models, both, you know, uh, they saw systems and as well as, uh, you know, strategies, do you have any models which are outcome based? Say, for an example, I do not invest. I do not pay you anything upfront. I do not pay you anything, anything in terms of a revenue model in terms of your, you know, uh, you know what to say, like subscription cost or cloud cost or something like that. I make money. I do my business, I make money, there can be some, you know, some certain, you know, leveraging period for me. And once I make out the money, you take some share of business of the, a share of uh, that money. And uh, that is part of a, a kind of a, uh, how to say a co co creation kind of thing. So jointly, the print, the 3D printing company, the, the DESO systems, both of them co create along with the supplier partner, and we make some money together. And then we generate revenue out of it. Do you have or do you are you planning are you thinking some kind of this kind of outcome based models for your future customers who are very very small and especially i'm talking about micro small and medium enterprises in india thank you we are we are always 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 benchmarking our business model and the way we are uh, uh, marketing and and, and uh, selling our solution or giving uh, it, it access to uh, it's the outcome based uh, model is one of them uh, so far, it's not the one we selected. <laughs> uh, I think we do prefer uh, people to 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 rent the, the software for some, some some period of time. It can be very short. Uh, you can they can stop at any time um, because outcome based uh, model is is difficult to manage um, from um, accounting and uh, because what what are the success criteria that will tell uh, uh, tell us uh, okay now. It's a, it's a moment it's a moment to pay. Uh, it's it's not that easy to to um, to deploy and to manage. But but what you have to understand is that we really think about uh, make it um, possible for everyone. But not that easy. But from Stratus' point of view, I think we we, we obviously it's, it's very challenging, you know, to take the not getting revenue because obviously we have a cost to manufacture the product. However, what I would say is that we have brands like MakerBot, who are very affordable, you know, which is about you know, a couple of thousands of dollars for a, a, an excellent product, which basically, you know, uh, since we acquired the company, we really transferred a lot of the knowledge from the, the patent we've developed into MakerBot. And if you take the, the method uh, printer from MakerBot, you know, it's got the heated chamber, which we see in the premium product, Part quality is excellent. Uh, it runs a uh, carbon fiber material as well. Um, you know, you will have some limitation, you know, in terms of the, uh, the system is not uh, going to be having the same uh, capability to print very large parts. Uh, you know, there will be some, some limitations for sure. But however, we will be able to, you know, gain some of the benefits, especially around jigs and pictures and prototyping without having to go into the major investment. One other thing we've done is this product here is about four times cheaper than a previous large format printer. So in the past, you had probably to pay, you know, almost half a million dollars to get a large format ADM printers from Stratasys. Today, we have this new printer, the F770, below $100,000. So already in terms of your return on investment, the cost per part is significantly cheaper. We are probably 50 to 60% cheaper in cost per part than in the past. And we've actually done some uh, benchmark uh, comparing the cost of per part uh, versus in China, which is obviously a very price sensitive uh, market as well, and comparing CNC there with uh, prototype. And we were in some example, for instance, a bus cup holder, so large cup holder for bus industry, we were four times cheaper. We took the same uh, example, again, another part for China, for an HVAC or ventilation system, a fan, quite large part, and we actually were able to be 3.5 times cheaper than CNC. So I would say, you know, you have to look at the return on investment. I think the printer are worth spending the investment, otherwise you will pay more. If you are still not able to meet that level threshold of investment, you can still look for service bureau. We will have those large format printers, 
and we can provide part on demand. So there's multiple ways for smaller companies to get into 3D printing now more and more, and at a much more, of, more affordable point than it was in the past. All right. It is uh, very, very uh, exciting and interesting to know that both Dassault and Stratasys have either solutions or business models which do not, to, for the lack of a better word, break the bank of an entry-level consumer. I actually have a very interesting story to tell here. One of our customers bought one of these entry-level maker bot solutions a couple of years back uh, at a point where he had very less money to invest. Uh, in fact, the, at that point, the printer for him was a luxury and not a necessity. Uh, the customer did manage to not only make enough money by selling parts out of that printer to get a ROI on that machine, but was able to fund a substantial amount uh, of the next bigger machine from the money that he made out of that small printer. So that's the that's the cycle that which Mr. Bosch was telling us about as well, that we start Start small, but we start fast and then take incremental steps, be fast, and then the, the investment will fund the next investment and the ROI will come automatically. Uh, the next question that I'd like to ask is that both of you have worked with uh, Daniel and Jan. Both of you have worked with global as well as Indian customers. And, of course, there's a, there's a huge difference in uh, operating process. What are some of the best practices of the global ecosystem that you would recommend to the Indian ecosystem? Um, one by one, you can take the question, and then maybe Mr. Bosch can comment on uh, on, on, the, on the matter as well. Maybe let's start with Jan. Yeah, thank you. So I think you know, for me, it's uh, it's very important, you know, learning from other uh, around the world and being able to transfer. So you saw the example from Siemens Mobility, who do a digital inventory is using 3D scanner. So one of the things that is very important is to get the right software. So getting, you know, a topology optimization software, a CAD software, you know, like Dassault is offering, getting a 3D scanner as well, and it will enable you also to speed up the creation of the CAD file. Because one of the key bottlenecks in the adoption of the technology we find is, is often the lack of CAD skills within the business. Um, and that's really the, the bottleneck because printing the file when you have the CAD file is very easy. You know, the software slices it for you, you just print, uh, you just press the button and it does it for you. Uh, the, we have some best support, so you just take the part, you put it into a washing tank, and for instance, on the LDM side, and then you, the support is dissolved. And then you just have to dry the part and the part is ready to use. Um, obviously, there's some post-processing like painting you, you may want to have, but you know, if you are looking at tooling, then the part is ready. Um, and that's really, really important. So the, the, the bottleneck are, you know, is really CAD, uh, 3D scanner, uh, the, the fact that the printer also can be integrated in the factory floor for many customers because we talk about jigs and fixtures as well as end use part. And, you know, we have printers which are ready for this integration. Um, also the, the knowledge to, to around the application. So we as strategists provide a lot of training. And I think that's very important is to, you know, probably take the first printer and not just outsource because many OEMs don't want to make the part themselves. You know, they are using tier one, tier two suppliers to make the part. But 3D printing is a very different process. And my recommendation to all the OEMs is at least buy one system, test, develop, understand the process, create your documentation for the certification of the process, and then you can subcontract to tier one, tier two supplier or service bureaus. Because then for you will be in full control of the process. And having a PCD or process control documentation for your process and also understand some of the limitation of each technology is very, very important um, because not all the parts will work. I think we have to be very honest here. However, with you know, the range of technology we have, we actually cover probably the widest portfolio of additive manufacturing uh, technology within thermoplastic. And that gives you a lot of flexibility to have maybe multiple technology to cover multiple applications as well. So that's really what I think is, is a key lesson. And if we look at you know, what our automotive are doing, you know, so they start from a tooling point of view and not the production first. You, if you are new to additive manufacturing or 3D printing, my recommendation is always look at jigs fixtures first. Easy, it's a one-off part, you can easily test it. And then you can look at spare part potentially and low volume production to start, and then ramp up into more higher volume production. Because obviously it's going to take you more time to validate the process, 
and validate the suitability of the end-use part. But we all know that if we can achieve end-use part, the cost saving is going to be huge with additive manufacturing. That's all from my side. All right, Mr. Daniel. Yeah, uh, on my side. You, um, yep. Yeah, on my side, uh, there is um, only one answer, one word: people. You can you can change if you have the right people. And I can tell you that in Europe, but also in North America, there is a big change. Why? Because now we have integrated, for example, three modeling and finite element analysis, and we get this very nice and fancy topology optimized part. If you don't have the right brain, which is managing both mechanical CAD and finite element modeling, you will not be successful. In France, we have at school now, in engineering school, people leaving the university, they know how to design, they know how to make a CAE analysis of the part. If you don't master both, you will not be successful. Um, I'm visiting a lot of companies in Italy, in Germany, and the, the, the manager of the company tell me, Daniel, it's very nice things what you showed us. Mod, mod team, whatever. Who, who should I hire? Should I hire mechanical people or stress analysts? No, it's, you should not hire either of them. You should have one guy having both at least a minimum of finite element modeling. That's very important, very, very important. And now we see that. We see people like that. Most of the time, of course, it's rookie guy coming from the university because hopefully, at least in France, people, um, we, they knew that. They've now put in place the right uh, cursus of training and education for the people out of the university being at the right profile level. It's very important. The second very important uh, thing is system engineering. I have a daughter, she's 18, uh, eight, uh, at 18 years old, 17 even. She was teaching her school system engineering. System engineering is fundamental. Uh, every single mechanical part could be uh, defined, predefined, specified using system engineering techniques. And when, if you know a little bit of these basics, then when you are facing much more complex problem, you will be able to, to, to solve those problems using the system engineering techniques. System engineering is very French, to be honest. <laughs> uh, French people, I don't know why they are maybe cable like that. Uh, they, and, and even in Japan, they were late. And even in the US, they were late. Uh, but now every single country is adopting such an approach. It's, it's a must. You, should, it's, you have no choice. You should master system engineering. You should have the people with a brain where mechanical and CAE are fully integrated. That's my advice. People. Skills, All right. So people. To, to, to summarize um, Mr. Mr. Daniel's point, uh, whether you are an individual listening to this or a company, invest in upskilling yourself or your people. That's, that's the key in... Uh, in enabling uh, uh, better results and uh, summarizing what Jan said is to start as soon as possible and uh, uh, at least take calculated risks, if not uh, if not complete risks. I have given you several examples of where people have taken risks and not just recovered the money, but made money. The next topic of discussion that I'd, I'd like to take uh, is again a question to Mr. Ghosh. Uh, we've seen uh, we've seen a lot of disruptions in the past one and a half years, and this is going to be the new normal, looks like, at least for the next one to two years. Uh, what has, what do you think you, as the automotive supplier community, has done to ensure a smooth operation, and what needs to be done further? So I will break your question into three parts. So there are three parts of this question. One is from the business side. Second is from the financial side and third is from the information technology or technology overall, uh, you know. So uh, from the business side, you know, the major thing is how to retain your customers for sustainability. It is extremely important at this point. You should not lose any kind of customers at this crucial juncture. Once customer have confidence on you, customer knows your supply capability, your quality capability, your delivery capability, your engineering capability, they will definitely trust you and future business will be more secured for you. Second thing in terms of business is if you, it's possible you need to also acquire new businesses. How do you acquire new businesses? It's all, India is all about manufacturing and technology. 
So when you say manufacturing and obviously third is people like Daniel also mentioned very rightly. And I'll just give an analogy to the earlier question what Daniel and uh, Yan uh, just mentioned. You know, uh, in India, it's very interesting that we always have a trade off between people versus automation. So, so one side we have social issues as well. It's such a large or large country and so many people. If you do full fledged automation, there is a possibility you lose or tend to lose the employability of people. So one side we have to balance it very well. That's why if you see uh, in Germany, France or other, uh, you know, or maybe in Europe it, uh, or in, in US, uh, there is always a lot of automation happening because the human resource cost is extremely high and obviously it is not affordable. You need to have automation in India. What happens? It's still on a much lower side in terms of the wages at the same time. Uh, technology uh, will also ensure that, you know, you lose to employ people and that's a social issue you need to grapple with. So this is part of the business side, which I was mentioning. Second is with respect to finance. So at this point of time, cash is extremely important and you need to really retain cash for your future businesses. Your working capital should be very healthy and obviously your balance sheet should show positive results to the investors or to the customers or to your suppliers so that the entire ecosystem runs very more smoothly. Last but not the least is about technology. So uh, as you know, what I feel is uh, we are talking about digital manufacturing here. And when I talk about digital manufacturing, can we really ensure we run our factories or our plants through remote possibilities? When I say remote possibilities is nothing but, you know, I can I run my factories remotely? Can I run my machines remotely without limited with limited manpower with maintaining a lot of social distance in India? What happens is in an assembly location, you see people just standing very close to each other and it creates a lot of social distancing violations. It, it, it's talking about COVID behavior. So if we can do a lot of automation, a lot of visibility, Today, the production manager or the shop plant manager or anybody sits in his home and can monitor the production over video conference or over, you know, teleconference or over, 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 you know, the video analytics or something like that. And he can say, OK, my productivity is intact, but I, I have minimum limited person to work in the shop floor to do that. So I think these are the manufacturing related transformations we need to look at from a technology point of view. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, IoT, artificial intelligence, 3D printing and PLM. These four technologies combined with each other should definitely revolutionize and also help with uh, for the suppliers or the partners or the, the tier one to tier four, all the organizations to have smooth operation for future. That is what is future. Future cannot be all physical and you know, we are all working uh, three days in a week or two days in a week. Somebody is completely working from home. But this cannot continue forever. So we need to have a balance between technology as well as, you know, and technology, when I say technology at the shop floor, at the core, at your supply chain, at your stores, at your assembly locations, at your manufacturing shops, that transformation has to happen. And that process has already started. Many organizations are already, you know, in, in the process. But as I again requested, and I will again request uh, DESO systems, LTEM, and also uh, you know, status is to find out a good model of collaboration and co-creation through outcome-based models. This is my request going to be there for for future also. Please find out some new business models and which will really help uh, the Indian community leapfrog very fast because uh, irrespective of, you know, other countries, our country is always short of, uh, you know, funds and uh, and that that problem will get, you know, addressed to to the points which I'm just mentioning. Thank you. All right, that's a, that's a, that, those are some very good points made. Uh, I'd like to ask the same question to Daniel and Jan. Uh, the, the lockdown situation per se in Europe has been actually much more stringent than India. Uh, how how has, has some of your top customers uh, ensured a smooth operation and what are the, the, the one lesson that you'd like to give to the community in India here. I, I will start this time. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the big, the big, the big uh, lessons learned is again one word: cloud. You, we were remote, okay? We were at home. Uh, sometimes we, with bad internet connection. <laughs> Uh, but still, we had a small internet connection. So, and because of cloud, people were able to work 
from home, maybe connect to their server, maybe continue to work like if they were working at the office. And, uh, the, and, and this was very important for us. You know, we are a very, very cloud minded company. We try to provide as much services on the cloud, not only data hosting, but also uh, data um, computation, whatever, even now design on fully on the cloud on, with a web server on an, um, a web app or uh, uh, an iPad. So this was very important. And, uh, and by the way, unfortunately, the, the, the network infrastructure, especially in France, was uh, uh, suffering, not only in France, because so many people were, were using the network. So cloud network, IT, uh, digitalization was key. And this is also the big, big lesson learned. All right. Jan, from the 3D printing perspective, what would you like to say here? Yeah, I think it's uh, digitalization is definitely one of the key words. You know, digital inventory would be one of the three key words I would be using here. Flexibility is the second one, and additive manufacturing would be the third one, because they all work together. So we need to be flexible in the current uh, situation with uh, the issue with the supply chain. And that's what the customer are now looking for. You know, they, they, they are stuck and they need a solution and they need a flexible solution to be able to print a duct one day, a bracket the, the next the next day, and mixing the, the parts and to be able to, to answer the need of the customer and, and be very, very offering something very, very flexible. And that's what I think additive manufacturing can provide. So, you know, flexibility is a requirement, additive manufacturing is, is a solution, but also it only works if you have a digital inventory. Because obviously, you know, if you don't have a CAD file and it's not available to everybody within your network, then only one site can be printing it. So, you know, it's really important what uh, as, as the other speaker was mentioning is that we have this kind of cloud or this digital inventory where the data are stored, you know, maybe using your PLM software and you can access from different sites all, all over near your customer site. And then you have those printers located in the right region. And that can really give you a huge amount of flexibility to reach, you know, within the, the whole of India, you could have printer in different location and you could service your customer very effectively, reducing the amount of transportation as well, but actually having potentially centralized a designer, centralized engineers who can really respond, take the need of the customer and then do all the CAD work, all the, the preparation for the file to be printed. And I think this is very important. And also you need to build a level of expertise on the process itself. And as I mentioned, it's really critical for the OEM to at least get you know, the initial printer to build that knowledge, because if you understand the process, you design for the process, your success rate will be much higher and the satisfaction of the customer will also be the result of that. So I think those are, are the lesson is, you know, be able to be flexible and think that, you know, beyond the traditional technology as additive manufacturing as a complement to your existing uh, manufacturing process. We are not necessarily competing here. We think it's not going to be replacing everything from the traditional manufacturing process, but it's a great asset to include in your portfolio for manufacturing solution. All right. Um, well, with that, we come to the end of uh, this panel discussion. I see that a lot of questions that were asked in the chat, uh, both Jan and Daniel have has managed uh, to answer them parallelly. Uh, we can take a few more questions. I'm just scouting through the chat box for the questions. Um, uh, uh, and uh, a, lo a lot of questions have been around affordability. Um, one of the questions that uh, I see popping up quite often is around how to make specifically 3D printing more affordable. Uh, and I'd like to put a point here before I give the, the question to Jan. Uh, to reiterate it, uh, when we look at affordability, we should not only compare the dollar spent on process one versus the dollar spent on process two. Uh, in many cases, the, the dollar spent on 3D printing, provided it's applied at the right place, will be much lower than the money spent on conventional manufacturing. Uh, Jan mentioned that uh, in many of the instances that uh, uh, CNC machining is up to three times more expensive than uh, than uh, using 3D printing. But if it's applied applied to a wrong application or probably the wrong geometry or the wrong sample size, then you will break the bank rather than making money out of it. The second uh, point I'd like to iterate is 
is by giving you an example of one of our largest customer, which is Ashok Leyland. Uh, three years ago, Ashok Leyland spent heavily on additive manufacturing, and today, after three years, they have saved almost 80 lakh rupees in manufacturing cost, as well as saved almost 14,000 man days in terms of production delays, labor, labor, uh, labor uh, use, and so on and so forth. So. The 80, 80 lakh rupees, which is just over $100,000, uh, plus the 14,000 days of saving, is a cost so big that is the is a is a uh, is a hundred thousand dollar printer affordable or not is no longer a question. Yeah, you, would you like to add on to that? I think so. It's a great point here. I think we we see you know within the the technology that many of our customers uh, have a payback, you know, around below 12 months, you know, with, with a printer. Uh, but it's it's about finding the right application. And what I want to say is that if you look at the, the Jigsaw pictures, we can do multiple applications. And it's not just we can do, you know, assembly aid, we can do gauges, we can do thermoforming, we can do Anovam tools, and I think the list goes on and on. And I think that's really what, you know, we want to, to help our customers and, and potential, you know, newcomers to the additive industry is to really broaden the scope and also look at, you know, with the same technology, you can actually do spare parts, you can actually do low volume production. And that's really something which is really, really important. By multiplying the application, also with the SAC technology, it's about the nesting. So, you know, if you find different parts and not just one single part to do your cost calculation, and you say, I've got a small, I've got a medium part, I nest them in the same volume together, your overall cost per part is going to go down. So your return on investment is going to get better. And that's really a, a, a new mindset because obviously when you do CNC machining, you know, you do one part after the other. With 3D printing, we can actually have, we have a volume. And the way we use this volume, the best way by having different parts from different geometry will have an impact and significant impact on the cost per part. And that's really something we need to to engage more with, with potential prospects and customers uh, mm -hmm. because it's not the same mindset as traditional technology. But as you said, we have many customers, you know, in India and around the world who are using our technology very successfully. Uh, and, uh, you know, you mentioned Asher Cleland, I, I did see some great example of some of the, the tooling they are doing. It's very large tools using some of the 912 carbon fiber material for metal part replacement. So not only there is you know cost saving, but there is also benefit in terms of health and safety as well, and light weighting of the part, and that's also very important for many OEM and manufacturers. So I would say it's you know it's a given, and I'm glad to hear your your example you know made of India, made in India with Ashok Leyland, but uh, we have tens uh, of similar uh, example of hundreds yeah. of them with customers worldwide who really see a huge amount of payback, and that's why Stratasys has been in business for 30 years. People keep on buying printers because the ROI is there. And it's not like, you know, strategy additive manufacturing feature, additive manufacturing is here already. As, I, as you just said, it's moving beyond prototyping and tuning into real manufacturing. And that's really the, the, the shift we see in the last uh, year or so. Thank you. Right. And um, I also see one question that is being repeated. How do we skill ourselves or our employees uh, towards learning these technologies without having to spend too much money on investing in it. Well, the good thing is that, and this is something that uh, Altem has done, done jointly with Dassault and Stratasys, uh, there, are, there are a couple of globally certified uh, skill development centers which have implemented both 3D printing and uh, design innovation solutions. Uh, uh, those of you who have asked this question can connect with us at Altem and we will redirect you uh, to those uh, to those centers where your employees can get uh, certified and trained on these solutions as per global standards. And I think we are almost uh, almost on time. I would now hand over the stage to Mr. Ghosh for the closing remarks. Uh, thank you everybody for attending it, and uh, you will you have our email addresses. Feel free to write to us uh, for any any other questions that might have been left unanswered. Thank you. Thank you, Avishek. You have done a great moderation for this panel and uh, you handled so many questions from uh, your side, also from the audience. Thank you so much for this, uh, you know, uh, for your, you know, conducting this uh, you know, panel discussion. Thank you, Jan, 
for such a great presentation on the products, innovation and technology. And also we came to uh, learn or we, we learned many new technologies which uh, are coming up or upcoming uh, in, the, in the future days to come and then which will really transform the industry the way it is working today. Uh, thank you, uh, you know, Daniel for your uh, great presentation on the, the PLM technologies and the future of CAD CAM transformation, which is really going to help all of us in terms of uh, combining additive technology as well as product development methodologies and really help in uh, doing better customer satisfaction and looking for you know big transformation in many areas. Uh, I would like to thank all the participants who have participated in this uh, event. Thanks to the ACMA North chapter, Minakshi, Mayank and the other team members. Thanks to Nirja who has tirelessly worked, uh, worked uh, for the conducting this event from uh, uh, the digital committee of ACMA. All other digital committee members, the, the, the steering committee and also, also the executive members of uh, ACMA digital committee for helping us conducting this event. And at the last but not the least, uh, you know, uh, obviously Cisco Webex because that this platform really helped us doing a seamless or I will say uh, error free, you know, event, you know, conducting uh, through this uh, platform. And uh, at the same time, I like like to again uh, wish that the way uh, Abhishek just mentioned about the, the trainings and the, the skill building kind of things. Uh, I will request uh, Nirja and Minakshi to work jointly with Abhishek to find out what kind of trainings which we can do free of cost either from ACMA te uh, Altem Technologies or from uh, you know Stratasys or from uh, DESO Systems. I know there are a lot of global courses uh, which are offered along with vouchers or something like that, which can be definitely offered to the member community. Uh, this will really not only help us building the skills, it will also help us in awareness creation. So awareness is extremely important. What is there? What is not there? What will help my business to grow? What will not help my business to grow? I think this this technology is always ever changing and we need to really have, uh, you know, these training sessions, awareness sessions conducted for all of us so that we can really work towards a uh, you know, the greater transformation in the entire ecosystem and the industry itself. So thank you so much all of you for attending and for conducting this event. Uh, uh, you know, thank you so much and uh, let's uh, close this event at this point of time. All the best. Thank you, Mr. Garsh. That was excellent. Uh, thank you for having us here. Thank you very much. It thank will you. be a pleasure to thank Mr. Parna Ghosh as well. He has left out himself. So thank you, Ms. Parnaji, for uh, <laughs> driving this uh, initiative of Northern Region. And it's really wonderful having, as uh, Parnaji was mentioning, it's wonderful having Daniel, Yan, Abhishek, everyone around. And it was really a, a wonderful session. And uh, um, all the participants, importantly, like uh, so much of enthusiasm that the topic and the speakers are created amongst the ACMA members, I could see we had a uh, very great participation and uh, so much of questions, which was handled very well by Abhishek. Thanks, one and all. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Akma team. Thank you. 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 Please keep yourself all safe and healthy. It's extremely yes. important now. Absolutely. Nice evening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank, you, Thank, Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Yan. Thank you. Thank you, Parnaji. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you so much. Last but not, not the least, Altam team, Reshma, thank you so much. Reshma? Thank you, Minakshi. Thank you. Thanks. It's a, it's a dream. Thanks, it's a dream Last, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> thanks, Satan, for your uh, valuable support, Reshma. Thank you. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you.